What's funny is I had this idea in 2011 as I was growing Hitail, and I wrote it down in a notebook, and I, I wrote it as YC for bootstrappers. And I thought, why isn't there a, a, an accelerator that caters to us, like my people, my micro, you know, microconf startups are the rest of us, the, the founders who, who kind of want to really bootstrap and don't want to do the institutional thing, they may want to run the business forever, you know, may never want to exit, or if they do, it, you just don't, you don't want all the baggage of, of all of that. And, and VC won't back you if you're going to do, let's say, 10 million, 20 million a year ARR. But that's a, that's a crazy profitable business if you build a SaaS app to that point. The startup investment landscape is changing, and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Woo! Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Always Bet on Black himself, Eric Hornung. That's right, Jay. You always bet on black unless red hits or zero or double zero, or you're playing blackjack in Vegas. (laughs) In which case, there's no chance of winning. Right. There is no chance of winning if you're playing blackjack with Jay Klaus in Las Vegas. I played the night before. I won a good amount of money, play with Jay Klaus, the dealer flips nothing but 21s. Unbelievable. She had the best luck of any dealer I've ever seen. And so we waited her out. We said, okay, let's wait for the dealer change. And I said, I'm going to follow your lead here, Eric. I'm going to try to bleed less slowly, wait for a dealer change. We get a dealer change and more of the same. <laughs> <laughs> so did she have the best luck or do you have the worst luck? Because there is one changed variable from the night before and that night. That's a great question, but you guys went to a different casino that night. That's true. Two change variables. That's a good call. That's a good call. So would you say that venture capital is a bit of a gamble? Oh, interesting. For the entrepreneur or for the venture capitalist? Well, for the entrepreneur, I would definitely say it is. But what about for the venture capitalist? Is it a science or is it a house always wins kind of thing? What happens? Great question. Well, you know, traditional venture model, they're kind of playing a numbers game thinking, I think... Traditional venture capitalists think of themselves like the house. They think of themselves that with enough investments following their fairly loose theses that they'll win out in the end. Yeah, I'd kind of agree with that. And I think it's based on this idea of hitting home runs. But today we have someone on who's making a different kind of gamble. That's right. Today we're talking to Rob Walling, who is the founder of Tiny Seed Fund. Tiny Seed Fund is a year-long remote accelerator focused on SaaS companies, software as a service. Before Tiny Seed, Rob was the founder of Drip, a marketing automation software, hybrid email service provider software, competitor of MailChimp and ConvertKit, which he found a lot of success with and was sold to lead pages, I believe, in 2016. He's also the founder of MicroConf, the world's biggest conference for the world's smallest self-funded software companies. And he hosts a couple of podcasts himself from Startups for the Rest of Us and Zen Founder. He's been active for a long time here, Eric. And he's somebody in the the circles that I run in, which are freelance, bootstrapping. He's a known name and his products are widely used. Yeah, I feel like we've been we've had discussions off the record about him and this whole evolving community for some time, mostly because here at Upside, we like to kind of play on the fringes. So what's new, what's interesting in venture capital from both a topics perspective, a geography perspective, and a organizational model financing kind of perspective. So anything that's new, changing, evolving, I think we find that interesting here on Upside. Yeah, looking at innovation in the venture space, you and I have been looking towards this for this since we started this podcast. And there are a shockingly few names that seem to come up, both of companies and of folks in that space. So they're known, and Rob is one of them since announcing Tiny Seed earlier in, or uh, yeah, about mid-2018, he announced it at the last MicroConf. So really cool to have Rob on the show today, especially given the timeline of Tiny Seed. The applications for Tiny Seed opened this past Friday on the 18th, and will be open for the next several weeks. So good timing on our part here to bring Rob on the show. There you go with the timing and the timelines, and here we go with the interview. Let's jump in. 
Hey guys, wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know about something Jay and I have been getting ready behind the scenes in 2019. When we started this podcast, Jay and I said that you, the listener, would have an opportunity to learn in real time, to think like venture investors with us as we meet a wide variety of personalities and examine a wide range of industries. Well, now we're going to share something new, and it's a little different. This new idea is called The Update. It's a carefully curated quarterly publication of editorials, trends, and stories happening outside of Silicon Valley. Jay and I will be writing stories about what we're learning about on the podcast, have guest editorials on interesting topics, and share news and updates from our podcasts. In some cases, we may even share some exclusive content or first looks. Our goal is to stay at the cutting edge and, of course, bring you along with us. We're super excited about it and know you're going to love it. If you want to be the first to hear about our Q1 launch and subsequent letters, go to upside.fm slash update to get on the mailing list. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Rob, on Upside, we'd like to start with a little background on the guests. So can you tell us about the history of Rob? Uh, sure. You know, I'm a software developer by training. I learned to code on an Apple IIe when I was eight years old. And I was just struck by the fact that I could make things. And, and I've always been a, like a creative person in that respect. Not necessarily, I mean, I do play guitar and I've written songs and such, but I've really been motivated by, you know, creating technology. And so after getting out of college and working for in construction for a couple years, I was wondering why I was doing that. And so I became a, a professional developer for a consulting firm that was building dot-com websites. So this back around 2000, 99, 2000. And it was super fun, super fun. Just to be able to get paid to build things was like, uh, it was it was invigorating. And that fun lasted for a couple years, and then I realized it was it was kind of a slog building things for other people, you know, and kind of the fun went out of it for me because I realized I wanted to create my own things. And so I started doing that nights and weekends, and every night and weekend that I worked, I thought to myself, I just want to do this full time. You know, I want, how can I do that? And it was, the, you know, the stretch of like the realization that I need to own my own time if I'm going to do that. And, you know, so that's when I decided to start building products. So 2005 was kind of the first little success I had. So you mentioned you're a musician on the side, construction yeah. worker, musician, software developer, true renaissance man. What do you do in the music field? I don't play much anymore, but I, I learned to play guitar in college. I was in a couple bands. One was a Nirvana cover band. That was pretty dope. And um, the, it shows you how old I am. But, and then I was in an original group in Sacramento. It was like a folk rock acoustic folk group and had a lot of fun. I was in it with my wife. And so I would write song, write, I wrote about half the songs. I would sing and uh, play the guitar. Did you meet your wife in it or did you join it with her? Joined it with her. Yeah. Wow. We met, she and I met on the track. We we're both runners. There are so many parallels. Well, I mean, musicians are consummate entrepreneurs. So I find myself drawn to musicians and artists in that same way, because similar to you, I've really found an appreciation for making things and doing whatever I can to build a life of my own design where I own my time and make things around that. I'm curious how you got access to or were introduced to the idea of software development so early. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. And it was a little bit by accident. My dad and mom had heard of, they knew computers would be a thing. And this is 1980. Two, I believe. Yeah, I think it was right. Early eighties and the Apple IIe had just come out. And we lived in the East Bay area, and my dad, you know, was was an electrician, and somehow I think just being around as an electrician, you work on these jobs, and he would build buildings for Apple, and then build a data center for whoever, and then build something for Genentech. Like he just was around the technology, even though he himself still is not good with it, you know. And so he and my mom talked, and they dropped a lot of money. They dropped like four grand in 1982 dollars on you know an electrician's salary, basically, to get my brother and I this Apple IIe. That's and amazing. And so. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was that was the game changer for us, right? And the fact that games were really expensive, we wanted to play games. We liked Dungeons and Dragons and that kind of stuff, and so we had to build our own because we couldn't pay the fifty. It was fifty bucks a piece, really, to buy to buy games. So we just started figuring out how can we make our own stuff, and it, it was a bit of luck, and then a bit of of the fact that it fit our kind of maker personalities, you know. So we'll, we'll fast forward back to when you started building your own products. What did those first products, that first product look like? 
they were terrible. And not only were they terrible, they were just the ideas of them were terrible. It was all, there was no one talking about bootstrapping. There was no one saying like all the common knowledge that's today, or even the common, like I wrote a book in 2010 called Start Small, Stay Small, the developer's guide to launching a startup. Everything in there now seems obvious, but no one was saying it at the time. So my ideas were like, hey, let's build a social network or what it was social news website for personal finance because hey dig is successful and personal finance ads you know are expensive and therefore you get a lot of money per click so i'm going to build that having no idea that you just can't do that as a, as an individual like the the odds of that happening are, are, are slim to none right so i launched so that was called flogs.com i launched feed shot which what was that it was you could take your so you when you used to post to your blog you used to have to go and notify you don't you'd ping out to all these services and i built a service to do that and charge tried to charge like a dollar or two dollars a month so i learned from there well you just can't make any money doing that there aren't enough people there's too much churn is that know? like an original rss feed yeah, although it's it would take in RSS feeds from your blog and then it would send it to I out see. to like 200 different news and blog services and such um, that were accepting these pings. So it was just a little utility, but you know utilities aren't going to be they aren't going to pay pay your pay your mortgage. Um, <laughs> so I learned things from them. And it was fun to launch and do things in public, but I also it was like a I need to niche down and b I need to charge real money to real customers who have a problem probably don't want to go B to C at all. I want, you know, all these things, right? I mean, everything I'm saying now is, oh, that's just common knowledge. Well, it wasn't in 2003, you know? So my, my first real click with that was in 2005 when I, I basically acquired this software product called .NET Invoice and it was in kind of alpha stage. It was still pretty, pretty rough shape and there were a few uh, alpha users. And that's when I realized, oh, it, this niche idea, I can kind of own this whole thing. There's no one else who's, who's given the source code away with the product in the .NET space. So every consultant who wants to build an invoicing app is going to buy this. And it was, they were selling for 95 bucks. And I later tripled the price to 300 and it didn't make a difference, you know, because again, if you're a consultant, 99 to 300 wasn't a, wasn't a big deal. So it was all those lessons, you know, I learned throughout there that I then carried forward and uh, start, I started blogging about it in 2005, which was, you know, another trajectory change. What were the people around you, whether it's friends or family, what were they thinking about what you were doing? Because this is such probably a, a rare thing to hear about and know people doing at the time. Yeah, no one really knew. I didn't really talk about it because I had had experiences when I was in college and shortly after, like when I was working construction, I would talk to guys I was working with and I'd say, hey, I'm trying to do this thing on the side. And everyone's, everyone just has a, you know, a clever, witty remark about how that's a dumb idea and how, you know, I was reading Entrepreneur Magazine or Fast Company or whatever, and people gave me a bunch of crap about that. Like, oh, you think you're going to be an entrepreneur? And it was kind of like, you know what? Like, screw you. I'm going to, yeah, I am, you know, and it took me a long time, but I, I just, I got enough negative feedback early on from people who just had no clue what I was thinking and what I was going to do with my life because, you know, you're just stuck in this it, it was construction. I didn't enjoy it very much. I just didn't like the people I was around. It was this closed mindset or yeah. uh, you know a fixed mindset of the folks I worked with. The only people that really knew that I was telling at that point were my my wife, and she was skeptical of it. You know, because I spent a lot of time. I spent nights and weekends for six months to build these things that I'm talking about, and they never did anything. And she's like, "What are you doing with your time? Why, why are you doing it?" I mean, she was always she was supportive but questioning, and kind of like, "Show me the money and make it worth it." You know. Yeah. Talk about good training, though, to be an entrepreneur and to face that type of adversity, even from people close to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's super interesting just to, to hear that background. So you started you started building these things. Get me up to how long from that net dot net invoice to drip. What type of time passed in that period of time? Seven years, seven years. And were you running the invoicing software through that time? Yeah, I was running invoicing software along with several other small products that I had either built or acquired. And I basically cobbled them together because .NET Invoice never got bigger than about three or four grand a month. And I went out, I mean, I during this time, I applied for Y Combinator I with, with two Yale MBAs and or MBA students. I was looking for funding for something because, again, I thought that was the only way to do this because yeah. there wasn't anybody talking about, you know. So um, so I was running .NET Invoice along with other things. And then I acquired Hittail in 2011, which was a SaaS app. And I grew that and realized there were some dead ends there due to it be, reliance on Google and high churn. And so then I was like, all right, let's 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 do this next thing. And that, that was when I started Drip 2012. So when you were applying to Y Combinator, that was probably just, what, three years into their existence, maybe even less? 
Yeah, I think it was 2007. Might have been two years in. Yeah, so they were right. they were pulling in like 20 companies a batch. They're probably looking yep. for teams that were super well rounded, had like a full idea, and knew exactly what they were building at the time. Yeah, we and we had that. I mean, we it was me. I was the developer, right? And we had these two MBAs, and MBA students, and we did have a fully full fledged idea. And we applied, and we got a phone interview. So we got through the first round, and it was from YC alums who were doing that. And I believe they said. I didn't even remember the number. It was like 10% of companies who applied get to that or 15% at the time. And uh, so that was kind of cool. And then we just, you know, we didn't make it past that. And frankly, as interesting as that would have been, I think it's, uh, I think things worked out for the better, to be honest, because I went this non-traditional path that, you know, we're probably going to dig into here. And that has just been, you know, life-changing for me. What do you think it is about either your personality or your background that all through this time where there weren't there wasn't a blueprint or there weren't role models for you to look up to that you just kept doing it anyway in this in this untraditional way it's a good question and one i've a- i've asked myself before i think growing up and especially in high school and college i worked hard to achieve things that that were not easy to do like i'm not a naturally gifted athlete but i went to the state meet as a hurdler in high school and frankly I'm just not that athletic. And so the fact that I did, it was pure, it was just grinding it out. Like I showed up every day, we worked out five days a week at the high school. And then I would often go two days a week to a local, you know, I was working out seven days a week as long as I didn't get injured. And nobody else was doing that in high school. It just wasn't a thing. So there was this work ethic of like showing up. And frankly, I don't have the work ethic that I had back then. Like I now I've gotten older and I'm a little bit like, I don't think I could do these 60 hour weeks, you know, anymore. But I think that was a big piece of it, of just like, I will make this work. There was just this this thing. And there was also an, I have to make this work because I was not going to work for other people my entire life. You know, I did the I did the times in the cubicle farms and it wasn't terrible, but it did decay my soul. You know, it, I wasn't creating like I needed to. And, you know, we're on video here, but yeah. I have this tattoo on my arm that says create. And that was the first tattoo I got. And it, it it's a daily reminder of if I'm not doing that, I will shrivel up. I will become depressed. There's actually studies. My wife's a psychologist. And there's studies they've done with entrepreneurs versus non-entrepreneurs. And normal people in everyday life who are not entrepreneurs have a much higher rate of depression. And founders have a much higher rate of anxiety. Mm. And that's what I found, too. I was depressed, you know, I don't know, clinically or whatever, when I was working for other people. And I, now I'm much more anxious. I totally, totally relate to that. And every once in a while, and hopefully this becomes more of a conversation, but it seems about yearly or twice or once every two years now, I see a pretty major uh, article that comes out that talks about the loneliness of being a founder of being an entrepreneur and how mental health, mental health is the crisis that we're not talking about in entrepreneurship. And it seems to be unfortunately brought on by the loss of somebody. This last article I saw was after the co-founder of Vine and HQ Trivia passed away from an overdose. So, you know, someone else that we've had on the show that's a good friend of mine, Webb Smith, he tweeted one time, he said, actually, he said in an interview, mental health is the story that we're not telling or that, that entrepreneurs aren't telling. And I thought that really stuck out, too. Yeah, I would agree. And if if you want to, th- there are resources. So my wife and I co-host a podcast called Zen Founder, zenfounder.com. And if you, whether you go and listen to that, because we have 200 episodes of that, and the whole point of that, it's called Startup, or the subtitle is Startup Family Life. It's all about balancing these three. As I said, I'm a multi-time founder. She's a psychologist and now an entrepreneur herself. So it's like kind of a good, and we're married to each other. So there's this interesting play there. A lot of, lot of info we've talked about, all this stuff, suicide, the whole deal. That, that Randy Zuckerberg quote too of like family, friends, exercise, sleep, business, pick three. Uh, yeah. I find that to be also unfortunately very true. Okay, so take me up now to to Drip and how you got Drip started because that's that's a name that probably a lot of listeners on the show here will recognize and have maybe even used for their email marketing. I'm interested to hear about the inception of that company. Yeah, so it was based on a need I had with my prior SaaS app called Hittail. So Hittail was a little $10, $20, $30 a month SaaS app that helped people with their SEO. And I wanted, we, we got a lot of inbound organic traffic that was part of my tool belt you know i knew how to do seo and paid ads and this and that so we got a lot of inbound and we weren't capturing very many via email right we weren't capturing a lot of email addresses and again this is 2011 and so people were not i mean i did a talk in 2010 
at a conference and about email marketing and how important it was and how you should build your list. And people like gave me scathing reviews and said I was a spammer and stuff. And I was not talking about spam, but email was unpopular, you know, until very recently. Yeah, that's wild. Right? It's, you know, it's really, it's bizarre to see the tides change. A split testing was another thing nobody used to do. Okay, so all that said, I wanted to capture more email addresses. And so I didn't want to go and embed an HTML form on every friggin' page of the website. We had 200 pages. And so I was like, why isn't there just a little JavaScript pop-up that can go on every page, right? I think I had seen one before. It wasn't some idea I came up with, but it was like, isn't there a service to just in slap some JavaScript on this thing and make that happen? And there was nothing. So this is before Sumo Me. This is before um, Optin Monster. It's before, you know, whatever else, you know, tool you would think of to do that. And so I hired a contractor to, to build that. And he, you, you know, he just used jQuery and styled it up and wired it into MailChimp autoresponders. And it took him a week of work to do it. And I was like, this is nuts. And we started, we got a bunch of emails. It was great. It worked fantastic. So I was like, why is this not a SaaS app? And as we were growing hit, as I was growing Hittail, you know, we were, I was relying on Google and the churn was higher than I wanted to be. I could never get past that. So I grew it up to about 25, 30 K MRR, which was great. Cause it was really, it was just me, you know, with a contractor. So the money was great, but I was like, am I going to be running this in a decade? You know, is this, a, is this a decade long business? Cause I don't know that I'm going to do it. So drip became this is kind of the next, the next thing. And that was December of 2012 when we broke ground on code. I, I got 11 pre-purchase commitments before we broke ground on code. So I talked to friends of mine and folks, you know, in the SaaS space and said, would you use this? Here's what it's done for us. Does this sound interesting? And they said, yes. So that's at the point we broke ground on the code. It definitely sounds, I don't know the founding date of ConvertKit, but I'm guessing that Drip was before ConvertKit if you're working on yeah. it in 2011. And yep. MailChimp was probably around, but still pretty nascent. Yep. And those guys, man, their, their story is kind of crazy too. Yeah, I know. MailChimp wasn't, I mean, they were more than nascent. They were the they were the 900 pound gorilla already because they had the free plan. They figured out how to do free with email. Uh, AWeber was another option. Constant Contact was not as much in our circles, but they had been around since 2000, I believe, 99. And then as we got into email, I learned, oh, Infusionsoft. I'd never even heard of Infusionsoft, you know, which is crazy. Think about today. Yeah. And then Active Campaign was a, I believe was a like downloadable white labeled software or something because they i believe they became SaaS in like 2014 2015 wild do you think this is kind of an aside of just my personal curiosity do you think that email is still on the rise as a marketing tool or do you think that we're going to see a post email type world soon i think it's i believe it's still on the rise i know people talk about post email and and sms and facebook messenger and whatsapp and all this stuff but i mean you know, we we put up a landing page the other day for Tiny Seed. It was October, I guess, a couple months ago, and you know, got three or four thousand email addresses. And to me, that's how I'm going to communicate with people. You yeah. know, I wouldn't uh, in ten years would I get their Facebook Messenger handle or you know some other thing. I, I guess I don't see an option today that will replace email. Maybe one comes out in the future, but there's no communication medium that I know of that I think will will replace it. Yeah, it seems like bots and SMS, they have higher open rates right now, which is what the buzz is about, but they're so invasive. Like, I, I don't I don't think yeah. I've ever had a Facebook Messenger bot or an SMS experience related to marketing that I was like, man, I'm glad I got that. Yep, yep. And and the asynchronous nature of email is one, is one thing that just no one else seems to be able to replicate. The, the fact that I get pinged on my phone for a text or whatever, and that's just the standard. It's, as you said, invasive is a good way, which is also, you know, there's a little bit of backlash uh, about Slack and just how it's destroying maker productivity, I think. Not destroying, but how it's negatively impacting it. Yeah, I mean, if anything's going to replace email, it'll be Slack, right? Yeah. But the problem with Slack is it's closed, you know, closed thing. So how would we have gotten the 4,000, you know, yeah. people that we got the other day? You invite them to a Slack group, and then that's just a catastrophe. If you've yeah. been in one with 4,000 people, it's nuts, yeah. you know? So... Rob, you you exited Drip a couple of years ago, and I read an interview with you where you talked about some of the reasons why. Could you share some of those reasons why you thought it was time to look towards acquisition for Drip? Yeah, hopefully the reasons I say are the ones that you saw because I don't know, <laughs> you know, because things change over time and especially your memories, you know, fades and such. Probably the biggest reason is that as Drip was growing, so I bootstrapped Drip, really self-funded it, to be honest, out of hit tail revenue. So it was, I mean, I put a couple hundred grand into it, you know, 150, 200 grand before it, before it became profitable. We got to the point where we were growing very quickly and we needed money just to hire people and keep the servers up. You know, I mean, we were, I was running it at break even. 
And every time we'd go up 10K MRR in a month and I would hire another engineer just to keep us going, you know, and then we'd go up 5K, I'd hire another, so, you know, another customer success person or whatever. And I realized that the cash constraint was truly a constraint on the business. So I was entertaining the idea of kind of doing a single round, you know, not not going institutional, but raising probably, I was look, thinking about a half million bucks of angel funding and just would have gone to my network and such. And during that time, as I started thinking about it, and by this time, that contractor who originally built Drip for Hittail had become an employee and then retroactively became my co-founder. So he had just been there since the you know day one and and took you know a minority position in the business. It just made sense to keep him around, and he was a true asset to the company. And so as I'm thinking about that and I'm talking about this you know with Derek, my co-founder, we were getting acquisition offers inbound, uh, and we got five of them in about the span of eighteen months. And we had to get an email, and it's like, hey, we love this, and you know we're strategic, and you know who they were, you know I knew who the companies were, and so you'd start a conversation and. It was never my initial intention to grow a company and sell it, but it did start to become appealing at a certain point of like, so we could raise a round out of a X valuation and we're going to need to go for another three to five years at this pace to really make that worth everybody's while. Because to me, raising a round is a commitment to the investors. I want to provide them with a return. Or we could basically get acquired. And the reason lead pages was was such a good acquirer is they had raised $38 million in venture funding. So I knew that they had the money to put behind us, you know, that they could add the, the fuel to the fire. And when we got in, it was like, hire who you want, double your, I mean, the day we got acquired, like we doubled the AWS bill because we just were running. I mean, I was turning stuff off on the weekends. It was just stupid. You know, it was, it was too cash strapped. So, and we could take money off the table so we could almost raise funding, but also have a good outcome for us as well. And that was that was the idea. So really, the four stakeholders in any acquisition, and it's who I wanted to guard, were our customers. I didn't want them to get screwed. You know, our employees. I didn't want anybody to get laid off. And then the founders, of course. And we had the cash outcome, and then the acquirer itself. You know, to provide them with with value. So at least you know for the I was there for about twenty months after that, and I feel like I've had conversations with multiple stakeholders, and you know things worked out that way. Things worked out well for everyone. What does like acquisition? outreach look like? Is it just an email that you get from someone that says, Hey, I'm looking to buy your company? Like, yeah. Is it really that basic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's two things. There's certain people, uh, you know, I knew Clay Collins from lead pages. He, I, he had been on my podcast. We kind of run in the same circles. We'd never met in person, but we know the same people just having been around for a while. And so he emailed directly and was like, Hey, we really like drip. Would you ever consider selling it? So he was very direct. Um, he's actually published that email in a, in a blog post. The others were, you'll get an email that's like, hey, I'm the, it's the corporate development, you know, is the title. So that you get from the corp dev guy or gal, and it's like, hey, we're looking at strategic partnerships. You know, it's all this very vague language, but like strategic partnership from a corp dev person means they want to start having a conversation about acquiring you. So, but yeah, it's just, it's an email or a LinkedIn, you know, outreach, and you just kind of got to read between the lines. And frankly, I mean, there were, of the five, there were a couple that were just an, a no-go almost from day one, you know, word one. It was just like, yeah, I don't want to work with you. And I don't think you have the best interest of the four stakeholders, you know, or the other three, I guess. And so there were some definite deal breakers and no-goes for me. Again, I didn't want anybody to get laid off and I wanted the product to keep going and, and grow. And that's what I was able to do while I was at, while I was working with lead pages. Because you had bootstrapped this, that decision was pretty much wholly in your court. Yeah, that's true. Yep. It was Derek and I together really were, were mulling it over, but we had the luxury of, you know, there was no, there were no venture capitalists. There was no liquidation preference. There was, there was no complexity there. It truly was, do we want to do this? And at, and at what, under what terms, you know, we could just basically make the choice, which is a luxury, uh, you know, someone who's bootstrapped has. When you say the terms, I want to talk about that a little bit more. One term that we hear very frequently in like the tech space is you get purchased and then you have a kind of a four-year lockup where you're not actually locked up but you either have some sort of earnout that gets paid or you have some sort of options that vest is that the same kind of things when you're bootstrapped or how does that all look i'm sure it can look many different ways yeah it's so i'm under nda so i can't like disclose terms but right. i can say that having seen terms from different folks and having talked to a lot of people as we we're getting acquired who had, I, I talked to other founders who had been acquired and what they told me is look if you get acquired by Google 
or Facebook or a big company like that, they lo- they basically give you a three year earn out. And they will also give you stock options, but they'll typically pay you cash up front and they pay you cash at year one and year two and year three. If you get acquired by smaller companies that are less less name brands, typically it's a two year earn out. And you can leave before then, you just leave money on the table, right? They'll negotiate and say, I'm going to buy you for 10 million and you get five of that up front and then you get two at year one and three at year two or whatever, you know, and, and it, that's all negotiation. And it's all, then you try to flip that around and you try to get a payment at 18 months and then you try you know, do that. But I have known founders who've gotten one year and 18 month, you know, earnouts as well. That was the case with, I had a very modest exit a couple of years ago and our deal was we had a two year earnout, but we had an earnout at year one. We had an earnout at year two. We, we left year two on the table because it was just miserable working for that company. That's but, tough. You know, I think most people listening to the show will have some experience with making some type of deal, whether it's a small cash deal for like doing freelance work or something. When you're early on in doing sales, sometimes deals are scary because it's like, I really want this, but I feel like if I don't ask for hire, I'm leaving something on the table. But if I ask for hire, they might just walk away. In a situation like an acquisition, that's a much higher stakes, similar circumstance. How did you think through that? Yeah, it can be millions of dollars literally won or lost based on how hard you dig in. It's crazy. And it goes right to your personal bank account. So it's even different than selling for someone else where you're getting a commission. Like it's it's it was it was really stressful. I gotta be honest. It was one of the most stressful things I've done in my life. And I even had, you know, I had help. I had a broker that I hired to just kind of back me up who's consulting and giving me stuff saying this is this is a great this is a good offer or this isn't. And these are the terms for me. It was, you know, it took a year from the first email to close. And the reason was, is because I did exactly that. I said, you know what, it's just not worth, you know, selling for less than X or with, you know, without these terms. And they walked away multiple times, several times for months at a time, you know, and that was, but you know, I didn't want to have any regrets in all honesty. And Derek was on board with that. I mean, I, I was pretty committed to hitting, hitting some certain things. And so I dug in hard and the even it was it was about six months of casual negotiation and then it was like five or six months of of intense 20, 30 hour a week like effort. I was almost not running the company towards the end. How aware what were your employees of this conversation going on and how did you guard that? I they were not aware. I did not tell them until about a month before the close because I just because to me I had to keep telling myself this deal is not going to happen. That was my mental frame. Because if I got too excited about it, I knew that I would, I wanted it, but I couldn't tell myself that I wanted it, if that makes sense. And I talked to the employees, we only had eight or 10 at the time. So I talked to them, one, met with each one individually once it happened. And I said, this, I'm going to tell you news that's good. It's going to sound like bad news, but I need you to trust me. This is going to work out better for all of us. Just hear me out. We're going to, you know, I think we're going to be acquired by lead pages in about a month. And here's why it's going to be better, you know. Would you recommend that same methodology if you were in the same position going forward? It worked, it worked very well. Yeah. I had the luxury of having a small team. If I had 40 people, I would have had to do a group announcement. And group announcements are tough, right? Because you just know no one's going to speak. And then people are going to go off and talk amongst themselves in private slacks. Whereas I sat there for an, between an hour, an hour and a half with each employee and basically gave them the news and then... And Derek did it with me with the developers because he was managing the developers. And then we'd just talk through, what are your questions? Boom, 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 boom. You know, go through them. It worked really well. Yeah. And and I don't think I wanted, I don't think I w- would have told him earlier because there was so much in flux, man. You know, at any given time, I could get everyone all up in, a, up in, in chaos and in a tizzy. And then if the deal fell through, it's like, oh, well, that didn't happen. So is Rob and Derek trying to sell a company now? You know, like it, it would have just been weird. So it, yeah. it it turned out it turned out good outside of your broker what resources did you use to like navigate these waters because one piece of feedback i've heard and seen as it relates to acquisitions is like there's not much out there and i I know brent b shore just released a book called the messy marketplace which is actually on my nightstand it's next book i'm going to be cracking open i've heard it's great and gives a lot of insight into the process but at the time it seems like there probably was a lot less there was a lot less, but what I did is I listened to, I, I'm an audiobook guy, so I'm going to say listen to, but what I really mean is read. Um, I listened to Built to Sell like three times. The nice part about Built to Sell is it's it's short. I think it's a couple hours and you just gain some, and he talks about selling a consulting firm, but there were some lessons that I took away from that. 
There was Finish Big by Bo Burlingham. I listened to that a couple times. Some of it didn't apply to me. Other parts, piece of it did. And then now there's a book. There's also a book called Before the Exit, Thought Experiments for Entrepreneurs. It's by Dan Andrews and Ian Schoen from Tropical MBA. And I read that. Just That just came out in the last couple of years. So it was after I was acquired. But that's a good one I recommend. And the Built to Sell podcast, Built to Sell Radio is actually pretty good to just kind of get some sanity checks. The other thing I did, so that's what I consumed because I was so stressed for months. It was, it was brutal. I also used my network and I talked to probably half a dozen founders, either via email or on calls, said, look, I have an offer. This you sold. What did it look like? Well, you know, basically asking all the questions you're asking me, except it's private conversation so they can actually tell you all the terms and stuff. And to find out what about this term? Should I do this? Is this a, is this a mine fee, you know, a landmine? And so that was, that was how I did it. So I want to move into post drip now, tiny seed fund. When did the idea for tiny seeds start percolating after drip? Yeah, you know what's what's funny is I had this idea in 2011 as I was growing Hitail and I wrote it down in a notebook and I I, I wrote it as YC for bootstrappers. And I thought, why isn't there a, a an accelerator that caters to us, like my people, my micro, you know, microconf startups are the rest of us, the, the founders who who kind of want to really bootstrap and don't want to do the institutional thing, they may want to run the business forever, you know, may never want to exit, or if they do, it, you just don't you don't want all the baggage of of all of that. And and VC won't back you if you're going to do, let's say, 10 million, 20 million a year ARR. But that's a that's a crazy profitable business if you build a SaaS app to that point. So why isn't there funding out there and an accelerator to help with that? And I didn't do it because I didn't want to deal with all the headache of raising investing. And it just sounded like a nightmare to me. And I also don't know that I had, you know, the, the network and the reputation at that point. So that's where it initially hit. When I, I spoke at MicroConf this year in April in Vegas, and I mentioned this concept of fund strapping, which is to raise like a round of a couple hundred grand, two to 400 grand, and really never intending to raise, raise another round after that. And I got a bunch of people coming up and I said, look, I've done 12 angel investments. Six of them are basically in companies like this. You know, it's re- people who are really bootstrappers at heart, but they're, they just need a kick to get into, into escape velocity. And I mentioned the companies, Cart Hook, you know, and, and Churn Buster and, uh, and Lead Views and a few others, Spark Toro now, that was after MicroConf, but a bunch of people came up to me after the talk. And that wasn't even the point of the talk. It was like a five minute last slide. And all these people were like, how do I kind of want to do that? Do you have more money to, you know, are you writing checks? And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of heavy on startups. Right now. But they're like, is there a fund? Who's doing this? You know? And I was like, I don't know. Someone should do that. You know? And yeah. then I, I, of course the realization is like, well, of course that someone is probably me. Like I'm at, you know, one of the folks who's just been doing this a long time and is kind of at the epicenter of, of the bootstrapper movement. And so that my co-founder with Tiny Seed appro- actually approached me after that, and he has some private equity ties, and he know he just knows LP, you know, limited partners, and he said, if you, if you want to do this, I would handle the investor side, and that was the that was sealed the deal for me. Yeah, and you you mentioned earlier that when you were doing Drip, you basically bootstrapped it with almost two hundred thousand dollars before it was profitable. You said and that's yeah. that's a position that very, very few people can come into a, a SaaS business with. So I imagine with MicroConf, we haven't talked about that here on the show, but that's exactly the audience for that that yeah. conference that you put together. And so that was just this past year, right? That was in 2018 or was that end of 2017? Yep. In tw- April 2018, I did the MicroConf talk. And then within 60 days of that, we, we Einar had put together a deck. He's, Einar is my co-founder. He and I were still just floating the idea and like, do we want to do, you know, is this a thing? And then as we started talking to investors and founders, it was like, oh, this is a thing, you know? And then we announced in October of 2018 and it was literally one email I sent out to my list and a tweet and it just, just blew up. And we, we were getting tweet replies from all kinds of, I mean, from, you know, Rand Fishkin and, and Joel Gascoigne from Buffer and Darmesh Shaw, and, you know, just all the, the folks who were kind of bootstrappers, they're either true bootstrappers or bootstrappers at heart, you know, and they were just like, this needs to exist. What help do you need? And that generated several thousand emails overnight. And that made it really showed us that the the deal flow and the investors, you know, were there. I guess my question kind of revolves around that initial 200 to 250,000 that you raised for drip. And then you said, and companies just wanted to like get a little bit more to kick something into orbit to reach escape velocity. Like what is the money being used for in a bootstrapping context as compared to what is it being used for in the traditional VC context? Yeah. With Drip, I didn't raise the money, but I pulled it out of another company that I had called Hittail. And I, it was about 150 to 
to 200. What I used that money for was to move faster. I was able to hire out I was able to hire three developers when we could really only afford to hire one and it got us to market and then got us feature parity. Cause once we decided to move from being a email service provider to marketing automation, we had a hell of a lot of work to do to get there because to, to go from MailChimp to Infusionsoft, if you know, if your audience knows it, like there's a lot of stuff in there and with one developer, it would have taken us a year or more. And with three, we were able to, to get there faster. So that's, I also used it to hire like a, a good design, like a really good designer who's expensive instead of what I had traditionally done, which is just go on, you know, Upwork or whatever and, and or build stuff myself, which is awful. And were you paying yourself or your co-founder at all at that time? Yes, we, but we were taking really, we were taking very low salaries, way below market. So you mentioned YC for bootstrap companies. Is that how you would describe Tiny Seed or what, what would you, how would you describe Tiny Seed to someone hearing it for the first time? I describe it as the first startup accelerator designed for people who would traditionally bootstrap and we're focused on SaaS, on B2B SaaS. I'm sure we'll wind up, really it's subscription companies, but that's just a cumbersome way to say it. But that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide folks. I know a ton of bootstrappers who are working side jobs or, you know, working on the side and it takes them a year to get anything done. And if they just had a year's worth of living expenses, 120 grand is is probably the number we're going to arrive at. If you had 120 grand and it's like, here, use this as a salary, just build the thing, you know, and, and get it out and they can really accelerate the growth because they'll have the focus. And it's not, the, it's not the 10 or 15 hours a week where you're the least productive anymore. Why B2B so you, SaaS? It's, it's just a market that I know very well and it's a repeatable, it, I, I could build B2B SaaS all day and all night and make them work. It's just something that has a very high likelihood of succeeding. And it is a repeatable process. Building social networks is not a repeatable process. You could start 100 and three of them will work and no one can really tell you why. Why did Slack grow so fast? I don't know. I mean, it is B2B SaaS, but it grew like a social network because there was a viral component. That is almost impossible to replicate. Whereas building a 20, you know, 10 million, $20 million SaaS company, like, Let's just, you know, we could just talk about the fundamentals that it takes to get there. It's like you solve this problem for this group of people, you land and expand, you start with a small niche, you go out, your price point should be f- minimum $50 a month, probably closer to 100 and you're going to raise that over time. You know, it's there's just these things. You ask for a credit card up front and then later on you become demo only. You know, it, I, it's just a playbook and it's I've been doing it for so damn long that and there's still so much opportunity there. So B2B may be too strong, but at least... I, I don't think we're going to do many B2C. Like B2C is tough, right? If you're going to do uh, uh, an app for prosumers or something, it's like ugh, the, the churn's really high. And that's where B2B, they're less price sensitive and churn will be lower and such. So you're asking yourself, why doesn't this exist? And my gut reaction is, well, there must not be any money in it. But I'm guessing now that you've run the numbers and figured out a way where that can work. Can you talk about those dynamics and what would make this work? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And that is something that Einar and I early on talked about. I said, it doesn't exist because vent, traditional venture capital really wants unicorns, right? They want billion dollar companies. And going down market is not something you do. It just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, but I'm here, you know, sitting, looking at all these companies that I see that really, I wish I could fund them all. I remember saying that at one point and someone said, well, why don't you? And I said, because I don't have the money. And they said, why don't you raise the money? And that was where I was like, I don't know. Maybe I just should. So what I dug in with Einar, because he's kind of the financial modeler guy. He's like a, a data nerd. He has a PhD in computer science and a lot of data modeling and stuff. So he got in and said, look, what, what do we think our success rate could possibly be? What are the different ranges? Because it's certainly going to be more successful you know, in any venture capital they don't run cohorts, but you know, in their portfolio, they're expecting what is it, seventy or eighty percent to just completely tank, and then some zombies, and then like one to hundred x. I would expect ours to almost be flipped. You know, I would expect uh, of my six angel investments that are these B two B SaaS that I think will be seven or eight figure businesses. They all still exist, and they're all growing at you know fifty percent, hundred percent year over year. And it's not because I'm, well, it's not because th- there's no other reason than it's just easier base hits are easier than home runs building a billion dollar company you have to throw you're just going to burn up in the launch most of the time and only one out of 100 is going to make it or i guess it's three out of 100 right becomes a unicorn right now that's the number whereas i think 80 out of 100 if i picked 100 companies uh, you know 70 or 80 of them is going to become a seven-figure SaaS business it's just you know 
maybe that's a little high number. Maybe it's 60%, but whatever the number is, it's a lot more. I mean, it's, you know, 3% to some, some large number. What's your return like for tiny seed on those companies that that 60 to 80% that are going to hit singles and doubles? Like what is the return? Cause the, the way that the three, 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 one, like VC model that we hear about works is like you get three that go be successful to go two to five X three that go, you know, they exit and you make your money back or something close to it. Three that completely fail. And then one that either hits a home run or goes to zero. And like, if you do that, then you get your 2.6 X return over 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what is like the similar math there in this six to 80%? Is it like they're giving you 1.9 or 3.0 X, like 3.0 X? Like what is, how does that all work? Yeah, we we have I don't have the three 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 one model for us. Einar actually does, and this is one of the the things I'm definitely more on the founder founder discussion side and the and the deal flow side. But yes, our our projected returns are exactly within venture capital IRR. So I don't remember the number exactly, which I probably should, but it is that two. What is it? Two point five x. I think average is two, average is two point six x return of capital over ten years. Right, and we're we're in that range. If we get multiple home runs we're at seven x or something you know it's it, or home runs for us sorry so yeah no it's it's in the same range and it kind of has to be because we're going to tr- a lot of traditional lps who are who expect that kind of return and if we can't give it to them why should they do it why shouldn't they just go invest in you know in Andreessen horowitz or whatever yeah so how many companies are you going to invest in your applications are opening soon so yep. what what does the makeup of that portfolio look like what are you looking for Sure. Yeah, we're going to do a batch of between 10 and 15 for our first batch. Just manageable and easy, nice small community. I think we're, you know, we're closing our funding round, our our fundraising, and we've raised enough for 11 or 12 companies right now. And I think if we get, we may get to the point, it's looking like we might have the possibility of, of having enough to run 20 companies, but I think we'll probably do two different batches, one batch of 10 now, and then a batch of 10 later in the year. Just stagger them. And that's with the estimated one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per company. Yeah, it's going to be between. I think one hundred and twenty is for a single founder, and then give or take, you know, let's say you add twenty grand per founder, so maybe it's one forty, one sixty for two and three, somewhere in that range. We haven't settled on exact, but yeah, that's the idea. Besides being B two B SaaS, what else are you looking for in these companies at the point of them applying? Yeah, it will take people in in all over the range. I'm sure we'll have you know a few with with no revenue. And then I'd imagine it's like more traction, the better. In essence, you know what, what anyone would look for. It's like MRR is a good signal. It's not that we're only going to take MRR, but that's that's where you start, right? Because it that means that someone has gotten it to the point where people are willing to pay for it. And that founder has brute forced it probably on nights and weekends to get there. So that founder is probably someone who is to be reckoned with. And I think the biggest thing that I'm looking for, and I'm not the one making the decision. There's, it's me and Einar, I have my wife interviewing people, the psychologist, right? Who knows founders. And we're getting other people involved to help. So it's not some myopic view of our opinions. But me personally, the founder is the number one, two, and three, you know, reasons. And then it, after that, it's like, well, what's your MRR? And what's how big is the market? I mean, it has to be big enough to support a seven or low eight figure business. But I've been having, you know, conversations with founders already just who have basically, you know, they got on the list and then they emailed me directly. And it's pretty fascinating to to talk to folks and to get a feeling for the personality quickly. And it's, it's like, yeah, this, I think this person's gonna, gonna execute, you know, please apply when we get there. And also on your website, it says, one of the points you have is we only succeed when you do. And you talk about a profit sharing model versus the typical carry model. Can you shed some more light on that? Basically, since we're backing bootstrappers, we don't want to remove their optionality to be able to sell their company if they want to, to be able to raise another round of funding if they want to, or to be able to not raise another round of funding and just own this thing 10, 20, 30 years, you know, however long they want to own it. So if they if they decide to sell, then obviously we all, you know, we all make out well there. If they decide to raise another round, then that that will work too. If they decide to keep going and own the company forever, we have to figure out some way to get a return. And so that's where the profit sharing comes in, where, you know, we'll have an arrangement where, hey, as you take, you know, as you take money out of the company, we we share in that in order to, to provide it. So what does the financial instrument look like there? Is it just some sort of like future agreement for equity or profit sharing or is it a unique contract i'm i'm curious and like what that looks like so we are 
in the process of that right now, talking to a lawyer to figure out the best way to, because there's the, there's what it appears like, which it appears like equity. Like we're going to, we're calling it equity, but there can be tax implications of that. If we have equity in a company and they leave money in the company, but it's a pass through, you know, it's an LLC or an S corp. So there's pass through earnings to us. Now we have a tax liability. So we're trying to figure that exactly that thing out is, is it equity or an equity like instrument? Right. And, or is it an, uh, an option, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yes. So you have the applications that are open, open now, actually just open on the 18th. How long are applications open? And when do you kick this thing off this, this grand experiment? They're open for, I, I believe about six weeks and I would love to kick it off at microconf in March, which is March, you know, 26th to the 28th this year in, in Vegas. That's, a, that's the ideal. It's just a tight time frame to do so. How do you feel about the weird contradiction of an accelerator for bootstrappers that raised funding to exist? Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's, it's funny how these things work out, you know, and, and the idea is what I've been telling people is I have a lot of founders who I've known who've raised these small rounds but are still bootstrappers at heart. And that's how I view this. Like even yeah. Jason Cohen, who started WP Engine, you talk to that guy, he's still really capital efficient, even though he grew this huge thing. Darmesh Shah is the same way with HubSpot. Like they bootstrapped that thing into, I don't know, probably seven figures before they raised. I mean, it, so that, that's how I view it. I, I'm st- I will be a bootstrapper no yeah. matter what. I was still a bootstrapper when I was working at Lead Pages, which had 38 million in revenue, you know, or in, in funding. You're the bootstrapper's bootstrapper. I, something <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, is there anything that we're not asking about Tiny C that we should be asking? Well, I mean, I feel there's some differences between it and a typical accelerator. Like Tiny Seed is one year long, right? Most accelerators are three months. And it's a year long because SaaS takes a long time, right? Don't let anyone tell you they can throw five million at something and find product market fit faster because that is bull. It takes so long. And SaaS takes way longer than than you know something that's growing virally or a social network or whatever. I mean, B2C things, you can force money at it and and force growth, but SAS just isn't that way. So we wanted it to be longer. We're also remote. We're a remote accelerator, one of the few. And the idea there is there's just a lot of founders with a, a spouse and or a kid, you know, and owns a home. And just I couldn't move. For Y Combinator, I was it was going to be a big struggle because I had an infant and we were up in New Haven, Connecticut, and I was going to try to commute to Boston and do all this crazy stuff at the time. And that would have been a big, you know, really hard for us. So one of the other things that accelerators are generally known for is like a community. And I think that's bolstered by the fact that you do go to somewhere and you do have like this three month really intensive sprint with 20, 30, 40, 50 other individuals who you get to know really, really well. How does Tiny Seed embrace or think about community? Foster that. Yeah, that's a really good question because that's a big part. I mean, when I think of an accelerator, I think of mentorship, little bit of money and community. Those are the three elements. And the community aspect, we want to get everyone together in person three or four times throughout the year, preferably one at the beginning. So everyone meets face to face and then we'll planning on doing either weekly or biweekly mastermind calls with the group and, you know, weighing in hot seat format. And then we're doing office hours similar to what you, you know, would hear for other accelerators. And we're bringing in all the experts that that you would expect, you know, the, the Heat and Shaws and the Joanna Weebs. And we got Jason Freed as a mentor and DHH and Laura Roeder of Edgar, you know, just all the, the laundry list of people who you'd want to be giving you advice, frankly, is, is who will be helping out during those, uh, during those calls. Yeah. Sounds like an awesome, awesome group of people. Well, Rob, thanks so much for taking the time. Really excited to follow Tiny Seed and see where this goes. After the show, if, if listeners want to learn more about Tiny Seed or about you, where would they go? Sure. Yeah. Well, Tiny Seeds at tinyseed.com and I am at robwalling.com. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, Jay, we just spoke with Rob Walling from Tiny Seed. I'm interested in to hear about your big takes. Big takes. As someone who's followed a lot of Rob's work for a while, and to be honest, I didn't know that Drip was Rob's company until a couple of months ago. But I definitely followed Drip. I didn't realize how early Drip had gotten started. And so to hear his talk from there about when and how Drip got started, I really enjoyed that part of the interview. I enjoyed hearing about how for decades now, 
he's been going against the grain with the things he wants to do. I think he's a kindred spirit to me in that, or maybe I'm a kindred spirit to him in that we really like to make things and make our own way. But a lot of his story really underscored the difficulty of that. And when he talked about how he bootstrapped drip and had to put in 150,000 to 200,000 of his own money to get to profitability, that's just a position that almost nobody finds themselves in. You know, that's super, super rare to have that type of capital to be able to bootstrap. And then if you did have it, to have the technical ability to build a team and build a product that actually returns that capital. So super rare skill set and an awesome story from Rob. And, you know, the big takeaway to me from all of this is he's exactly the right type of person to be doing this type of what you call an accelerator or venture model with tiny seed, because it is going to be very difficult, I think, from a model perspective and have somebody who can come in and personally mentor these teams because he's done the B2B SaaS himself for years and to have a partner who understands the numbers and the model a little bit more, I think is a really, really good combination. It's kind of funny because I was kind of feeling that vibe that you guys had, especially when it came to like email marketing. And for the listeners, Jay handles kind of all of that for us. He's a wizard at it and I have no idea what's going on half the time, but I could just kind of like feel the connection. I kind of felt like mayo at a hot dog stand, you know, and you guys were like ketchup and mustard. It was just like, (laughs) I was the oddball out for a bit in that, in that earlier conversation. But that's, I think that's that's right. Is that like it's good when people find a partner who is who is different. And when I asked the question about the math, I could tell immediately like, okay, maybe his co-founder is like more of the me in this duality. Right. I'm not the math guy. And before you you even jumped on, he and I were talking about. I said, hey, so what do you use for podcasting? Because he runs two podcasts podcasts himself, and I wanted to get into the weeds a little bit on production. He's like, well, we use Zencaster and it records locally. And, you know, we're just, we have a shared vocabulary because we have a similar skill set or place that we focus. So I really resonated a lot with his, his message on that. And you're also like really big into construction. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to WordPress sites, sure. <laughs> have you ever built anything in your life? Like with your hands? Uh, yeah, yeah. And my dad's an amazing carpenter. This is actually right. one of my biggest regrets was that I didn't spend more time learning carpentry from my dad. For Christmas this year, I have this history of getting Christmas gifts for my family that is mostly just time with me doing things that I want to do anyway. That's the most so narcissistic my, gift of all time. Well, you know, I think that you want to give experiences and like memories to people as opposed to stuff. That's at least what I tell right. myself. So my, my gift for my dad this year was a promise to build something with him this year, the two of us. I haven't decided what that's going to be yet. Is it going to go in my apartment? Are we going to build it for somebody else? He's retired now, so usually he just builds pieces of furniture and builds them for members of our family, then drives them in his truck to wherever they are in the country and uses it as an excuse to visit too. But otherwise, no, construction's not my bag. Building stuff, not my bag. The nice thing is all you have to do is build something that's like functional. You just have to hit a single, right? You don't have to hit a home run and knock it out of the ballpark. Yeah. What other big takeaways did you have from this conversation with Rob? I think it's just just that. It's this idea that, actually, I forget who it was. Maybe it was Naval, maybe it was some other VC philosopher on Twitter. But they said, if you just go to the Fortune 500, go in their doors, get on their systems, and find all the systems they have, there is a billion-dollar company for each one of those systems because they are all so bad. and. I think about that all the time when at my full-time job, I see the systems that we're using and they are just all horrific from time card submission to HR systems. It's just like if you just took a startup mentality to those and it wasn't created, I mean, that's why Concur, the travel and expenses company dominated so fast is because everything is broken and created by Oracle and they're not allocating their best resources to it or the most time to it. For sure. I'm really interested to see where this model goes, because I do still think that the math is a little fuzzy to me and hard to understand. And I would love to really, I I would say I would love to nerd out with Einer to look at the model. But honestly, I would love to watch you nerd out with Einer and talk about the model. Part two, you hear that? Tiny VC, if you're listening (laughs) in, you're listening to the episode, we got a part two. Yeah, because I'm sure it's going to be pretty in depth. And I would just love to know what some of the assumptions are and and what they think the hit rate's going to be and where those founders need to be at their journey. Because he's he said that MRR isn't the only thing they're looking for. But I imagine if they're taking 20 companies or less, 
they're going to have plenty of applications of companies that have some pretty impressive MRR. And so, you know, being a rare model and really the only model at the level he's talking about where they're looking to fund these companies, they're going to have pick of the cream of the crop, which really helps the model, I would assume, because, you know, they're essentially for that specific niche and type of founder, they're going to be the gorilla in the room. Yeah. And I love that. I love the idea that you could like, this is like, I think we've talked about this before on podcasts, but like the nichification of the internet, like all the, all the big stuff has happened or is happening. And there are pathways set up to create something very large. There are not as many pathways to create something not very small, but mid-sized. Yeah. You asked about the financial instrument for what those deals look like. That's also going to be something to watch moving forward, whether it's their own innovative form of things. You know, I don't know what the latest innovation in financial instruments is. The safe note is what I hear referenced most as one of the more innovative forms. Anything else that you're tracking on? You have the SAFT note, which came out of the cryptocurrency movement, which is the safe note, but with tokens instead of equity. You also have what Republic created, which is interest bearing debt in the form of tokens. I, I think that most of that is more geared towards cryptocurrency, but maybe there are some concepts that can be pulled out. The most interesting thing for me is this idea of optionality and what that would look like in this context, because you could effectively take a position in a company that isn't a position. It's just a like a futures contract. How does that work? So at a really basic level, an option is either the right or obligation to purchase or sell an asset at a time in the future. So if I am buying an option instead of buying equity in this company, that option can be in three years or upon a liquidity event, which could be an acquisition or an IPO or bankruptcy. I reserve the right to cash in uh, essentially on my equity stake that this option represents, or I can cash in on my right to future cash flows of the business via a revenue or royal or royalty program. And I'm guessing that there's not a tax implication for holding options until you actually purchase the options. So that I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm also I'm not a tax <laughs> lawyer. I'm also not a lawyer. I'm also not a tax accountant. So all of this information is my understanding of it and is definitely not any sort of legal or financial or accounting <laughs> advice, just in case anyone was unclear on that. But I do believe there is some tax ramification for options, but I think what he was referring to was the tax implication of passing through earnings to your LPs, because in a partnership model, you get a specific tax document that says, okay, this portion of the earnings of the company are attributable to this individual, and that can increase your tax burden without seeing any cash. Well, I'm excited to follow Tiny Seed as they move forward. Something that you asked that I'm embarrassed you asked that I didn't ask was about the community aspect of the accelerator because that's a core component of the accelerator that I run that's also a remote accelerator. Community is super, super important. So I actually have a question on that for you and it deals with shadows. Having run a virtual accelerator, which means that people are generally remote, you have a concentration around Columbus, so you can do some live and in-person events, but and that might be a little bit different here, but... You have a remote accelerator. Community is important to you. Mentorship and access to services is also something that Unreal does. So it seems like the three pillars kind of line up. What shadows do you have about Tiny Seed's ability to execute on those three pillars given your experience with Unreal? I don't know that I do because the way that Tiny Seed is set up is to create money from the investment in these companies. I mean, from a ethos standpoint, they want to empower those entrepreneurs, and that's going to happen if they provide this $120,000 to those entrepreneurs. And for some entrepreneurs, that may be enough to help them build the company that is profitable, that returns what that investment is, and that's going to be a win for Tiny Seed. You will inevitably have founders in just about any accelerator who don't show up or take advantage of the mentorship, the community, the office hours. They don't do that. And that's a real problem for the other members of the accelerator if that's the main value that they're looking for one of the main values that they're looking for in joining but if it turns into you know the founders who join are mostly looking for the capital 
and the mentorship, you have some flexibility on the community aspect of things. But if that is what he talks to the founders and that's what they're looking for and they join, they're saying, hey, listen, I'm a solo founder of this bootstrapped company. I work in isolation. I don't have anyone to talk to. I don't have anyone to learn from. And community is what's driving them to join. Then maybe I do have a little bit of shadow of the remote nature of it. But there's a lot you can do even remote to to facilitate that. Every time I talk to someone who's gone through Unreal, not every time, but a lot of times they will tell me, you know, I was really surprised how quickly I felt a personal connection to people just through video chat. Do you think then the one year time frame versus the 10 week, 12 week, three month time frame, do you think that's a benefit or a hindrance? I think it's good because for these types of founders, their wins and their progress is going to be spaced out. It wouldn't make as much sense to do a weekly cadence the way we do in Unreal. I think that by spacing it out, you put calendar holds on people's calendar far in advance and they'll probably prioritize it because it's a more scarce event throughout the month. But I don't know. Remains to be seen. I think it really depends on the founders who are joining and what their motivations are for joining. And I think that's something they'll probably look at. It's certainly something I look at as far as culture fit and dedication to the calls and to the community. And I would imagine that Rob and his team are looking at something similar. So in a traditional VC raise, you generally raise about enough money to get you 18 months of runway. That's like the guidance that I've read, I've seen, I've heard. This funding gets you 12 months of runway. And a traditional accelerator, your goal would be after three months to raise that 18 months. So this gives you 12 months. Is the idea behind that, or do you think the idea behind that is that at the end of those 12 months, you should be having enough profit to kind of pay yourself and you don't have to worry about that runway as much because you're running this profitable business? I would say yes, because I think what he's doing is really taking his experience with Drip, and I'm sure he's talked to a lot of founders in a similar spot, but taking his experience and saying, I had to bootstrap this and put this much money in to get to a point of sustainability and profitability. And I think he's modeling after that type of trajectory to say, we want to give these founders the amount of funding to get to the point of optionality where they can raise a fund. They don't need to raise a fund. Did you just say raise a fund? Raise funding after that 12, 12 months. Great. Well, this is a fun one. And I hope to explore some more of the company's funds that are operating in this ecosystem so we can learn more about the kind of bootstrapping movement. Jay, I know that you have been on the Tropical MBA podcast, which kind of focuses on location independent bootstrapping. Yep, that's right. So guys, if you have any thoughts on this, obviously this is a innovative type of approach. You can tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at upside.fm. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating on iTunes. It really helps us bring on high quality guests to the show. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at upside.fm or find us on Twitter at Upside FM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find Upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff and Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Never mind, bro, that can't be mad. I'm lighting it on fire, used to run victory last. And still, I'm not even tired. It's all about the time, about the timing, yeah, that's what they say. Well, I'ma keep on rhyming, find a way to